how play and oh okay how play and art can be fun um, and strengthen family relationships i want to thank today's sponsor james d brown cpa um, you can actually still sponsor the last one if you're interested give us a shout i'm going to talk for like three minutes about Bergen Volunteers, um, just to give anybody who's new to our organization a little background about us. Um, and I, I will try not to bore you. Um, so Bergen Volunteers is a 55 year old nonprofit. We're based in Hackensack, but we serve the whole county and beyond. Um, we're, we are not a county entity. We don't, we're not a, a county arm um, in terms of being, uh, we are a nonprofit 501c3. Uh, our mission is to strengthen communities through volunteerism. We have our own community programs that we run. We match volunteers to external nonprofits and organizations. Um, we work with about 100 nonprofits. Um, we also run civic leadership programming, community engagement programs. And we help businesses with your corporate social responsibility. So if you want to help out in the community and you don't know where to go or what to do, we will guide you um, and we'll also match you with other volunteer opportunities um, wherever there is a need. Um, we collaborate, like I said, with a lot of nonprofits and businesses in the area. We support um, youth, veterans, seniors, people with disabilities, people who are low income, at risk, anyone who needs extra support, we, we kind of fill the gaps of the social welfare network. So if we don't have, we consider ourselves a hub. If we don't have a service, we'll connect you. Um, I like to call us a community center without walls that matches resources with needs and needs with resources. Um, some of the community programs that we run, um, our chore service uh, offers minor home repairs, um, helps people age safely in place in their homes. Our cheer service helps with uh, people who are homebound. We do grocery shopping and medicine pickup. We uh, pick up furniture from people who are donating furniture, and then we um, furnish apartments for people who are leaving homelessness, uh, homeless shelters, and moving into apartments and em empty homes for the first time. We offer free tax preparation for low to moderate income families, um, gifts, for those who can't afford gifts during the holiday season. We have a mentoring program um, that helps um, youth, caregivers, um, first-generation college students. And then of course our Bergen Leads program, which is our flagship program and also um, you know, kind of where the Lunch and Learns came out of, our alumni um, who are running those, um, or I guess holding yeah. those Lunch and Learns. Um, that's our program that has a very robust leadership curriculum and site visits. You learn about the county and how to be a leader. Um, and this is our 15th year, and we've had 400 people come through that program. Um, we hold a lot of necessities drives for things not covered by SNAP and school supplies and food drives in the summer for students who are on free and reduced lunch. Um, okay, so I, I, think I, I think I said it all. Um, so um, again, thank you to James Brown, CPA, for sponsoring the Lunch and Learn today. Our website is bergenvolunteers.org. Everything I just said is there, so you can go look it up. So now I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Um, like I said, our Bergen Leeds alumna, class of 2017, Suzanne Mannion. And I'm just going to read her bio because I do not want to mess it up. Um, Suzanne Mannion is Director of Public Affairs for the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation a nonprofit that since 1980 partners with the National Park Service to restore and preserve these two beloved monuments. She oversees media relations, external communications for the foundation, which enables her to engage with press from around the world to share the history of Lady Liberty and the Ellis Island immigrant experience. Examples of some especially exciting initiatives include the 2019 opening of the Statue of Liberty Museum and the recent visit of a mini Statue of Liberty replica from Paris. It was Suzanne's Blame It on Bergen Leeds moment that brought her to the foundation. After 20 years as co-founder of a small PR firm, the camaraderie and experiences provided by Bergen Leeds helped her muster the courage, confidence, and curiosity to tackle a new challenge. And so without further ado, welcome and take it away, Suzanne. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Dina. My first question, uh, what screen can you guys see? My computer is telling me I'm on the wrong screen. Can you see my face? Like, yeah. can you see this? Or do you see a picture of a bunch of windows? No, no windows. We see your face and like the name of the presentation. Excellent. OK, hi, everybody. I'm on the right screen. So yes, I'm Suzanne, class of 17. And thanks so much for having me here today. 
Um, uh, I am going to give you guys a quick overview about the foundation and why we're around and uh, what we do, and then focus mostly on what it would be like to visit the Ellis Island Museum, uh, National Museum of Immigration. So our foundation was created in 1982 to raise funds for and oversee the restoration of the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island for their respective centennials. Uh, we have since raised over $800 million, all from private individual donations, no government funding. So if you've ever given to our foundation, thank you. Through our endowment and dedicated uh, fundraising campaigns, we have supported more than 200 projects at the islands. And um, I'll touch on just a few of those major ones today. Um, as I said, we were founded, I have to just close something because I'm distracted, okay. Um, so Lee Iacocca was our founding chair. It was brought about by Ronald Reagan because the statue was in a bit of disrepair and coming upon her 100th birthday, there was a call to, to fix her up. So here are just a few images of the statue throughout the years. The restoration took place uh, starting in the, in the late 82 and then through to her birthday. Um, this was in the, probably in the 50s, 40s or 50s, this is in the 80s, and this is today and the new museum is, is right here. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so her actual birthday is on October 28th, 1886 is when she was dedicated, but we did the opening for the her restoration on the 4th of July. Uh, there was a penny campaign and a keep the torch lit campaign. So any of you were around then, maybe you participated in those fundraising drives. So this was the largest freestanding scaffolding when it was erected and um, obviously allowed the workers to go up there and do the, the repair that needed, that was needed. Um, her, they removed all of the spikes from her crown and, and cleaned them up and put Back. The patina obviously was not removed because that's actually uh, keeps her safe, keeps the copper safe. One of the largest components of the restoration was replacing all of the armature bars that make up really her bone, her skeletal structure, and, and keep the copper in shape. Uh, part of the nose was repaired, and as well as one of her um, curls had to be replaced. But uh, probably the most obvious undertaking and the most obvious to the public was replacing the torch. The original torch had been altered for the years. Um, windows were cut into it, trying to make the statue a lighthouse. And that effort failed. But what it did accomplish was allowing the elements to come into the statue or through the torch and really damage the torch uh, and the flame beyond repair damaged her arm as well. So a workshop was actually created on Liberty Island. Artisans from France came over and, and uh, worked with American teams to uh, create those armature bar replacements I mentioned and to recreate the uh, a replica of the torch as Bartholdi envisioned it. And that is what's up there today. Liberty weekend took place over the 4th of July holiday in 1986. There were tall ships, fireworks, concerts. It was, it was quite the affair. It was uh, broadcast uh, nationally on, on ABC, actually globally through other outlets. Um, so that, I'm gonna fast forward to 2019, just to keep us on Liberty Island for a moment. Uh, we did other projects after 9-11, after Sandy, but this was the next major one. Uh, and this museum opened in May of 2019. Previously, the Statue of Liberty Museum was located in her pedestal, but after September 11th, the National Park Service, our, our partner, they restricted the number of people who could get into the statue. So uh, that was limited to about 7% of the 4 million plus visitors could get up to her crown, and about 20% could get into the pedestal. So the goal was to make the educational experience available to everyone. And that was what led to the building of this new museum. Uh, there are three galleries within the museum that tell the statue's history. 
why she was created, what inspired Labelais and Bartholdi, the sculptor. Um, one of the bits of her history that, are, that I found was unknown to myself and a lot of people when, when we did the opening a couple of years ago is Labelais was an uh, abolitionist and he was inspired of course, by the long history of our countries together and both countries working towards the, a, a democracy. But he was a strong abolitionist and, and with the Civil War and, uh, and then ultimately with Lincoln's assassination, it was important for him to recognize that. So if you, when you, and I don't have an image here, sorry about that. Um, on her feet, on her left foot, there are broken shackles and that demonstrated uh, Breaking the bondage of slavery. So that was one of the symbols I learned about only relatively recently. So throughout the exhibit, you'll there's an throughout the museum, there is a replica of Bartholdi's workshop. So you get a sense of how the artisans constructed her, how they went and uh, scaled it up until it became the size she is today. This is an exact replica of her face, so you get a sense of scale. And that original torch now lives in what we call the Inspiration Gallery, and it really is a great view of the original statue juxtaposed to this. So if you've not yet made it out there, I, I hope you can come on out. Um, now we will move on to Ellis Island and the National Museum of Immigration and the Immigrant Experience. The, um, just as a point of reference, uh, most of you on this call, since you're local, probably know, but Ellis Island is, is, is in the Port of New York. Um, for New Jersey bragging rights, I guess. Uh, there have been court cases about where the statue and Ellis are located. Um, so New Jersey gets the waterway around Liberty Island. New York gets the actual statue on the island. I don't think that's fair, but what have you. And then Ellis Island, uh, New York gets the building, the historic building, and you step outside that building and New Jersey gets everything else. So that's how it is. So when immigrants came up the Narrows, uh, the ships docked here in, um, in New York Harbor. And first and, class, first and second class passengers were not required to leave the ship. The inspectors actually went on and inspected them, put them through uh, the, the inspection process and they were on their way. However, people in third class, steerage class, were required to get on ferries and, and go to Ellis Island. Um, and those ferries, this is Ellis Island today, the ferries would dock here and um, the immigrants would make their way into the immigration station. So we'll talk about that a little more in, this, in a minute. I just want to give you guys an overview of the actual museum. So it's three floors um, and it, when it opened in 1990, the focus of the museum was the Elena Ellis Island immigrant experience. And a majority of the exhibits today continue to focus on the Ellis Island immigrant experience or the history of the island itself. Um, there are two galleries um, on the first floor where we added this content over the last 10 or so years. And it was to address experiences before and after the Ellis era. So uh, peopling of America deals with uh, from the colonial days up through the mid 1880s and uh, over here on this wing, it's, we call it new eras and that's contemporary um, immigration through to today. And looking at, you'll, you'll find many similarities regarding why people left and came here uh, and what the experiences they had you know, relative to the time that they, that they arrived in the US and left their homeland. So today I'm gonna to focus, as I mentioned, on the Ellis Island immigrant experience and a bit about the, the island's history. So here is an image of Ellis Island. Um, this is one of the exhibits, it's called Ellis Island Chronicles. It's, it's located on the, um, the third floor. And this talks about the history and evolution of the island itself. So the Dutch referred to Ellis Island as one of the oyster islands. And the oyster beds were very important to the Algonquin speaking tribes of the area. Uh, when the federal government took control in 1880, they built a fort for um, the war, no, I'm sorry, they took ownership in 1808 and they built a fort for the war of 1812 
it never saw any action, but this was the original island uh, for Ellis. And it was about just over three acres. Uh, but when it, was, when it was selected to house the country's first federal immigration station, these additional islands were created using primarily landfill from the New York City subway construction project. Uh, over here, they had hospitals, dorms, quarantine for infectious diseases. Um, today, the island is one island because it has a connection here, also landfill, and that area that was water was filled here. And it takes up about 27 acres. Just this part here is the slip for visitor ferries to come through. So um, I just want to let you guys know about a couple before we get more into the immigrant experience, tell you about some other exhibits that you will see. So up on the third floor, additional galleries are um, silent voices and restoring a landmark. So Silent Voices discusses Ellis after it was abandoned by the government in 1954. After 1924, when immigrant quotas were put in place and the visa system began, there were they, the number of people who could come to America became limited. And also uh, with people flying as they arrived as opposed to through ships, uh, uh, via ships as the years went by, there were fewer and fewer immigrants being processed through Ellis Island. So ultimately the island and the buildings were deemed excess surplus and shuttered by the government. Uh, the government actually tried to sell the land. However, there was public outcry because of its historic significance. In 1960s, uh, in the 1960s, I'm not sure the exact date, President Johnson declared Ellis a national monument and that saved the structures. Uh, here are images of just sort of, of Ellis just sort of left in time when people walked out the door. And then here are some images when the foundation came along and started doing um, the restoration in the mid 90s. So one of the key things I've learned about the restoration need and the damage that was done uh, is there was severe water damage. Now the building had been abandoned and I guess via their own boats, people made their way to Liberty, I mean, sorry, to Ellis Island and they, ravaged the place, they stole copper and, and other elements and windows were broken and the weather really wreaked havoc on the inside of the, of the building. And so the first 18 months of the restoration was blowing hot air into the buildings to um, get rid of the, the, the dampness, the moisture. Um, here's just a pretty interesting image of the um, the great hall slash registry room with, with all the scaffolding there uh, for the workers. Now, um, the restoration was completed in 1990. That was two years before the Ellis Island Centennial and the Ellis Island Museum of Immigration was open. So I'm gonna tell you now a bit about how the Ellis immigrant experience is depicted at the museum and I'll spotlight some of the exhibits. So with this outline here shows you some of the reasons why and when different groups came here as immigrants. Um, trends throughout the decades and frankly the centuries were, there were some similar reasons, better life, escaping persecution, um, definitely see an uptick in the late 80s into the 1990s um, 1800 into the 1990s with the, the steamship coming and more and more people uh, coming to the U.S. But this is you, your immigrant history may fall in line with some of these uh, trends. Uh, prior to 1892, the states were responsible for processing immigrant arrivals. In New York, that took place in New York Harbor at uh, Castle garden it was called at the time. So it's right here in the battery and uh, that's that's where immigrants were checked in. Here's Castle Garden now known as Castle Clinton and that's where you get tickets if you're going to go and board the ferry if you're going to Liberty or Ellis Islands. 
So uh, Castle Garden was the first immigration station in the US. And as you can see from the stats here, it was by far the largest, welcome the largest number of immigrants arriving at that time. Uh, uh, there is, were many reports of immigrants being mistreated. Uh, con men would swindle them from their money or offer, offer false claims of assistance. Uh, so that was one of the reasons that the government decided to take that process off the mainland and put it on Ellis Island where it was set apart. The other reason being that more and more people were coming to the States and, and uh, it became a matter of uh, bandwidth of where, where they could put everyone. So the peak years of Ellis Island, it opened in 1892. The first building was made of wood and actually burned down in the mid 1800s uh, and had to be rebuilt at, to the structure that, you, that we have today. Uh, much like Castle Garden in the earlier years, you see that uh, Ellis was by far <laughs> the place where most immigrants came through during these, these peak years. The busiest year being 1907 and the busiest day being 19, April 17th. Uh, some of the factors for that particular day um, were a backlog of ships coming through. It just took a while to process people. Um, there, these are a list of uh, countries and nationalities that made up most of the Ellis Island immigrants. They're in alphabetical, not numerical order. Hopefully I did it correctly, alphabetically. Uh, these images were taken by a man called Augustus Sherman. He was a clerk at Ellis Island. And he took about 250 photographs beginning in 1905. He asked the uh, immigrants to put on their traditional garb. And many of these people were detained, which we'll talk about in a little while. And these images are featured throughout the museum. Uh, it took about a month or so to sail to Ellis Island, depending on where you were coming from. Most immigrants traveled via steerage, we talked about before, and that was located in the lowest levels of the ship. So you can imagine you're there with hundreds, if not thousand other passengers, you're next to the boilers and the engine room, there's poor ventilation. And I have often thought whether or not I'd have the courage to do this. And I think the answer is no, I don't believe I would have had it in me, um, I don't think, to have made that journey. Uh, so as I mentioned, the ships would dock here in, the, in um, the harbor and then the steerage passengers. And as well as if you were sick or had other issues, you would get on a ferry and uh, come over to Ellis. So here, and please bear with me while I show you all some video. Um, this is footage of immigrants arriving at Ellis Island. Um, it was shot by Thomas Edison and his team in the early 1900s. It's funny, I work as the bio mentioned, I work with a lot of press and they're all, often asking me, do you have any footage from then? I'm like it, it was the 18, it was 1900, there wasn't a lot of cameras happening. So mostly still film photos, but I find these images fascinating, especially looking at so many still photos and then seeing the immigrants um, walking in, you know, in, in, in true life coming through. So as immigrants disembarked from the ferry, they came to what is the, the current building, the one that, that was rebuilt after the fire, and they prepared to enter to go through inspection and the processing center. So this is what we see today when we enter the museum. This is the first space you come to. It's referred to as the baggage room. And uh, as you're looking at this picture scanning, just take note, I'll point to it. This is just a large space. Um, these stairs over here, they'll, they'll become relevant in, in a moment when, when I move on a bit. So this is what the um, immigrants saw. So another thing I imagine as I'm, when I'm in Ellis Island, which I fortunately have a chance to do often, is an immigrant arriving. They have everything they own in this bundle that they've been carrying and taken care of since they, they left their home. And here they are asked to leave it in the hands of strangers uh, in the baggage room as they move on to be, to be processed. And again, yet another leap of faith 
uh, may seem small, but when that's all you own, you 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 were uh, as they were asking a lot. So another video which I don't really didn't really do well with. So hold on one second. Um, this is the Great Hall or registry room as we see it today. And this is what the immigrants would have walked into. Uh, so again, imagine if you've left the only home you ever knew. You probably lived in a small village on weeks on a ship and you enter this massive room and upwards of a thousand people speaking 50 different languages. It's loud and overwhelming. There are people in uniforms. Maybe you left an authoritarian country and seeing people in uniforms and they're pointing you and bossing you around been very, very intimidating. And of course, this is the last leg where you're hoping to be admitted to the United States to start your new life. Uh, put yourself again in their shoes, these groups of people, and you're waiting your turn to speak with an inspector. Uh, for 20 years, as many as 5,000 people a day were processed through this room. I mentioned April 17th, and that's when over 11,000 people were inspected through this room through the inspection service officers. People would wait here to hear their names. Um, and then they were brought to this area where the inspectors were. Today in the museum, there are uh, replica stations and you can stand there yourself and, and, and see what the, um, what the immigrants experienced when they were called up. Here I'm just sharing a picture. This is like one of my favorite pictures, a great image from the Great Hall looking out and you can see Lady Liberty. Everyone was put through a medical exam examination. Uh, actually, the exam began as the immigrants were climbing those stairs I pointed out before towards the registry room. Doctors were watching them. And if the doctor noted issues such as labored breathing, a limp, uh, along those lines, you would receive a chalk mark that indicated you required additional medical evaluation. Everyone was tested for trachoma, I think I'm saying that wrong, uh, which is what's happening here. The inspector is using a button hook. So if you all are familiar with shoes from the 1800s, there weren't uh, ties, rather people used buttons and this was used to put the loop through the button, the button through the loophole. And that was used to pull back someone's eyelid. Uh, Tacoma wood could cause blindness, was very um, contagious. And the cat's meowing, I hope that's you. Um, and in addition to Tacoma, uh, TB, those were the two most common medical reasons for being denied entry. The concern being that the immigrant would become a ward of the state, unable to work. Uh, due to their, their deficiencies. And that was something that was wanted to be avoided very much so by the government as they welcomed people. Here we see an image of passengers being questioned by the inspectors. This is where those tables were I pointed out in the, in the contemporary photo. Uh, you could really equate this to today's customs experience if you're traveling internationally when people check your passport. What the inspectors were doing were going through the manifest, the ship manifest. Now, there's a myth that names were changed at Ellis Island. That wasn't the case. This ship manifest is, is just like if you're taking a plane today. The, uh, you, this was filled out at the port of departure. And so on there is your name, your address, your age. And at Ellis Island, what was simply happening were the uh, inspectors would call you up. If you didn't speak English, there were translators who would help you. And they just went through the list of questions. What was your name? Your last permanent residence? Where are you going? Are you being sponsored? And they just checked to make sure that information was correct. So if your family story is our names were changed at Ellis Island, that's family lore most likely. And what many immigrants did is, is they uh, Americanized their names over the years to, uh, to fit in, to, to assimilate, which was, was important for them. So once you have gone through that medical check and you've spoken to an inspector, you make your way to the stairs of separation. 
so there were three stairways here. Uh, when Ellis was active, there were actually fences that went up to the roof, so one could not jump from a staircase to the, to the other. Um, if you descended down the left staircase, you were headed to New York City or New England, back on a ferry and on your way. The right staircase uh, would lead you to the ticket office where you would prepare to travel to other parts of the country. And those two staircases accounted for 80% of the people who came to Ellis Island and they were processed in roughly five hours and on their way. But if you were directed to the middle staircase, you were among the 20% of passengers who were detained on Ellis Island or the 2% who were denied entry. So the reasons for detainment or denial were medical or legal. We talked before about TB and other issues. Um, and uh, note that if you were detained or denied entry, it's actually the responsibility and the cost of the steamship company to, uh, to cover the cost of you being on Ellis Island or for you to return. So they carefully vetted, pa vetted passengers before they left their ports of departure. So there was a need to house and care for detainees at Ellis. So there was life on Ellis. There was a schoolroom, uh, cafeterias. There were dorms and these stacked up as high as in some places, you know, three or six even high. And there's um, on the third floor of the museum, there is an example of, of one of these dorms. You could, that's what this is. You could, you could see what the accommodations were like, if you were. Um, and when, as Ellis Island was being built, the government had miscalculated the number of immigrants who'd be coming through. And that led to the need for the continued expansion of Ellis throughout the early 1900s. Holidays were celebrated on Ellis Island. Uh, I mentioned before, translators were available for people. And every ethnic group also had an aid organization on Ellis to assist newcomers. Uh, if you were traveling with a group, say it was a family coming and um, one person was, was ill and had to be left behind, uh, especially if it was a mom, not necessarily the dad, uh, they would be, the rest of the family would be encouraged to leave the detainee behind and they would, they would meet up later. So these experiences I was just talking about are featured in exhibits on uh, the second floor. Through America's Gate uh, talks about the whole questioning process. The hearing room is if you wanted to fight your deportation. Peak immigration years exhibit um, that explores the, the massive immigration from 1880 through 1924. Again, why people left their homelands and how they adapted to their new lives in the US. Uh, it also talks about the, the changing attitudes towards immigration, which really is also covered in those other two pre and post Ellis exhibits that I talked about. But the changing attitudes towards immigrants, um, that's what led to new laws and new processing procedures. Um, and these areas also talk about the immigrants' experience themselves. There's a quote, which I'm going to fumble a bit here, but um, of an immigrant saying, I was told that the streets were paved with gold. And not only were they not paved with gold, they weren't paved at all. And I was expected to pave them. So that uh, dream of coming to America for a perfect life obviously was very, very hard, especially for these third-class steerage passenger immigrants who came here with very, very little. Um, I want to bring us back to the third floor of the museum now. And this is one of the most popular exhibits. It's called Treasures from Home. When the museum was being created in the 1880s, there was a call to Ellis Island immigrants and their descendants to share items that they had brought, that they had brought from their homeland. So I'm just going to show you a few videos here from that exhibit area. So throughout Treasures from Home, uh, here are immigrants who, uh, images of immigrants who uh, they, that they donated. They donated housewares, religious tokens. In this image, you'll see uh, a camera. They also, oops, hold on one second. 
Um, many traditional clothing were, were donated. Um, remember the Augustus Sherman photos. So this is what people uh, would have dressed in when he was taking their pictures. They brought them with them, not necessarily their traveling clothes, but their, their traditional garb. And here, this little guy, he is a fan favorite. Um, he, the teddy bear that was donated and actually his, uh, the replica of this teddy bear is, is um, sold in the gift shops on Ellis Island. Uh, a wonderful way to learn more about immigrant experiences is through their own stories, uh, which you'll hear throughout the museum. But for a more expanded experience, uh, I recommend you check out the Ellis Island Oral History Project. It's one of the world's largest and most diverse chronicles of the immigrant experience. There are nearly 2,000 interviews from passengers, families, immigrant, immigration officials, mil military personnel, detain detainees, uh, former island employees, uh, and, and what it was like on Ellis Island. So I've shared here the URL. You can also just find it on our website um, under Discover. And uh, you can hear them and or read transcripts of these, of these stories. And um, we also really much encourage people to capture their own oral histories or that of their family members today. So if you visit the American Family Immigration History Center, which is located on Ellis Island. Uh, this is where you will find a, a database of people who came through the Port of New York from 1820 through to 1957. Um, and about a third of Americans can trace their ancestry through the Port of New York. The database I just mentioned was unveiled by the foundation in 2001. And that was the first time that these arrival records became available to the public online for free. Uh, this database is available free online, again, via our website. And on our website, you'll find video tutorials and tip sheets about how to uh, search for your family history. Um, and members of the foundation uh, also have the opportunity to work directly with one of our research experts to help with your search. Um, And if you're exploring your family history you can, and find your manifest, you can get a copy of the manifest. That's another thing that's exclusive to, to um, the foundation are, are these digital copies of the manifests. The manifests themselves no longer exist. Uh, the ones prior to the original Ellis burning down, those were all damaged. So different types of uh, documents are used for those immigrants. The ones from the mid 1890s onward were recycled during World War II, but beforehand were put on microfilm. It was with that information, those, those pieces of data that the foundation worked with an organization called Family Search, digitized all of that immigration data and made it available online. So that, that's what you find today when, when you are either on site at Ellis Island and use the History Center or go to the database online for free search. So I was also mentioning uh, oral histories. I think I just touched on this. You know, ask your family, get their story now before it's too late. You know, it's, that's really important to hear firsthand people's experiences, and that helps tell our own story and just the and not just but the history of mankind. Really, get it firsthand. Um, finally, I just want to share with you guys that the foundation also created something called the American Immigrant Wall of Honor. Uh, this was an initial, initially a fundraising tool in the 80s to uh, raise funds for the restoration of Ellis Island, which as you can imagine costs hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, the Wall of Honor has grown to encompass all immigrants, not just descendants or immigrants of Ellis Island. And we, People look to it to celebrate their family heritage, whether their family came before the Ellis years, mine is part of those, whether they came through another port, I also have family that came through Boston and Canada, um, or if you arrived last year, uh, you can put your name, your family name on here to celebrate, commemorate, 
being part of the American immigrant experience. There are over 770,000 names on the wall, which uh, is located outside of the museum. And as you can see here along the lower Manhattan skyline. And if you're interested in honoring a family member or yourself, if you are an immigrant, uh, please, you can find that information on our website and always feel free to contact me. So that's about it. That is it for me. And I am very welcome, oh, open to uh, answering any questions you guys have now. So please feel free to unmute and ask a question if you would like, or you can put it in the chat. Thank you so much, Susan. That was um, amazing. I hope you guys come out. The, the museum is open. Um, from a COVID standpoint, it was closed for a handful of months, but Liberty Island has been open since July and Ellis since August. Um, there are some limitations, mostly through the interactive touch screens. Uh, just be, they're just being mindful of that, and that will that will change eventually. On Liberty Island, just on July first, that mini statue that was mentioned in the bio. That's the day it came. That was the day that the pedestal reopened. So just in case you will want to visit, there always are day of day of tickets, whether you leave from New York or Liberty State Park. But if you want to access the pedestal, uh, you should get those in advance. And once the crown reopens, those tickets go on sale six months in advance and they sell out quickly. So uh, keep an eye out. And if you want to make a date, go there in advance and, and take a look for those tickets. So I am happy to answer questions to the best of my knowledge. And if not, I am also happy to get back to you once I retrieve the information from those who know more than I. Great. Hello. Hello. Hi. I just talk. Hi. Go right ahead. Um, I actually have two quick questions. You show two areas on the first floor, one that processed immigrants from the early days up through 1890 and the other area from 1945 to the present. What happened to the 55 years in between? Well, the 55 years in between is what Ellis Island was. Those two galleries uh, they just tell the history. Though those histories did not take place on Ellis Island, but rather it's what happened in the country before Ellis was opened in 1892 okay. and after it closed. So that's what those two galleries deal with. It that history did not happen on Ellis Island. Just those galleries tell those. Perspectives. Right, so the rest of those years that were processed through Ellis Island, because I know Ellis Island my years. mother came in 1920. Ah, so she was part of the peak. Where did she come from? Well, they traveled on a Romanian passport, but they were actually from Russia, but there was so much back and forth at that time. Yeah. And that's another thing. Are, do they still, are they still interested in collecting documents and things that are originals from the, the immigrants? Because Absolutely. I have become the keeper of the flame <laughs> for the original, my grandparents marriage license and I have the original passport. Yeah, be in touch with me and I, I would direct you to the uh, library on Ellis Island uh, that is run by the National Park Service. So there are historians there. And when people come to us with, with these treasures, that's where I direct them. Yes, I because I'm getting to be <laughs> old. And of course, my kids, they don't, they don't want anything. It's that's the thing. It, you know, I, I'm far from a history buff, but this does really fascinate me. And I've only worked with the foundation, been with them for a little over four years, but I've worked with them since the mid '90s as a consultant. So it it, it it's just great. And um, yeah, give it to a museum. So when your kids say, hmm, <laughs> they know it's safe somewhere. Well, I just don't want them to wind up in the dumpster when they clean out my house. Mm -hmm. And not only is the documents, I have my grandfather's silver cigarette case. It's all engraved in Russian. And I have this magnificent capelet that my grandmother made for her trousseau. And they managed to bring it with them. So wow. I would like to know that they went to some organization. Yeah, that please be in touch. Yeah, um, yeah, Nina, Melissa, they can share my email and my phone number. I'm 
very open to, to passing. That would be wonderful if you could share that. That would be terrific. We can send yeah. it out afterwards. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Rosalind, I see you unmuted. <laughs> oh, thank you, I, yeah, I did. Um, my question is, my grandparents came through Canada. I don't know, how would um, I find out, you know, any information uh, on them from, um, would, would Canada have any information or would one of the states near there, like probably Maine, how um, they got through there? I am not sure. Are you familiar with the website Family Search? No. Okay, I'll write yeah. that down. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's another free database that is more extensive. Ancestry.com has it too, but at a certain point, you have to pay for access there. But right. check out Family Search. Um, and if you hit any walls, again, give me a ring and I'll, uh, I'll connect you with our team at the History Center. Because although our database deals strictly with the Port of New York um, and our history, uh, the research experts there they know much, much more. So if you can't find that information directly or you'd rather just bypass the Googling, let me know. I'll put you in touch with them and, and they'll give you some tips. All right, thank you. Thank you very That's much. Right. It's very good, very good presentation. Oh, I Thanks. hope, I, has anyone on this call been out here before? Out here, I'm at home actually, out to the islands before? Not since I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I brought my my youngest, my oldest. He's twenty one now, and I think he was one <laughs> when we went. <laughs> well, having grown up around here, someone said when they were a kid, I think it was fifth grade that we were taken to Liberty Island and climbed up Liberty Island. Uh, but I had never gone to Ellis before before this. But clearly, when I was in fifth grade, it was still abandoned and not a museum. But um, just even how Liberty has changed over the years, it's, it's interesting. But you know the the um the the, dis, the school district where my kids go, they bring them every year. They take. They them. still do. Okay. Yeah. I think it's like fifth grade, maybe is the year they do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that makes me happy because obviously last year, uh, school groups stopped coming, and um, I am happy to report that on weekends, especially visitations up to about fifty percent. Uh, but it is actually a great time to visit if you're a local because. Although we want the international travelers back, they're not here yet. So it's not that crowded and uh, it, it can be a more enjoyable experience in the summer because you know that's obviously where most of the people are here. We're hopeful that the uh, students will start coming out again because to your point, uh, Barbara, about your kids, I, I don't know if they're taking it all in while they're there, but no, in hindsight, like, yeah, I remember being there. Oh yeah, that was really cool. So hopefully that will continue. And we've, what we did during the pandemic, our foundation, um, we started to create uh, projects like this, of starting to do things online and, and virtual experiences, which do not replace a visit to the museums, do not replace true academics, but we were just trying to replicate the experience to the best of our ability. Um, and we're hoping to continue that. We're trying to get funding for that now. So it can, for the most majority of people who can't actually get to the islands, they'll still be able to learn more about it. So these really basic PowerPoints that I put together, I'm hoping to make them a little more vibrant video more, and do some interviews. That's, that's something I'm hoping to do over the next couple of years if we can get some funding that people everywhere can experience. Great. There is a question in the chat, so I'll read it. Um, it says, I took my kids to Ellis Island several years ago. At the time, I put on a play. Does Ellis Island still put on plays of the immigration story? No, we don't, not, not right now. I was, I was disappointed to hear that too. Um, it, uh, I think it was a staffing thing, but um, no, that, that currently is not something that we do. But again, if I had the proper funding, we could do a little film about it. But you know, with in time. But yeah, that's that's unfortunate. We don't have that just now. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I see from the chat. Before we wrap up and say thank you again, does anybody have any final comments or questions? I do. Great. I don't know who so, that was. Oh, Rocco, Rocco. hi. <laughs> hi. So you mentioned that uh, it's it's folklore that uh, they changed people's names. 
So the depiction of Vito Andolini arriving from Sicily in Godfather Part 2, where they look at his name and they say Corleone because he came from Corleone, Sicily, that is not true. That is not accurate. That is what my history lessons at work have taught me. And it's funny you bring that up because uh, no one had mentioned that. It last, last week was the first time someone mentioned it. And it was a film crew from China. <laughs> this guy's a film buff. And he asked me the same thing. So I, I said, I do not know that specifically. I'm not going to call Scorsese, although we did honor him, right? Was that Scorsese or was that? No, uh, Coppola, the, Coppola. Coppola, yes, Coppola. yes, yes. Um, ooh, that was wrong with me, sorry. Another Italian there. <laughs> Um, but no, that is what my, um, those who know much more than I have taught me that that would be okay. untrue. Yeah. But what may have happened to, uh, Vito and his, and his brethren is when they went to the Lower East Side, if anyone has visited the Tenement Museum, you'll know that's an amazing museum. Please give them your support as well. Um, and ended up on the Lower East Side. Maybe he just lives in a neighborhood with a bunch of people from Corleone, and that's where the name came right, from. So right. you know. Gotcha. Yeah. Because all four. All four of my grandparents, both maternal and paternal, came in off the boat from Italy. Uh, One pet. My my paternal came in 1903, and my maternal grandparents came in 1912, and they came off the boat. They went through the same thing, and the maternal grandparents settled in uh, Lower Manhattan mm -hmm. on Mott Street. Mm -hmm. And my paternal grandparents settled in Jersey City. Eventually, yeah. the maternal, eventually the maternal grandparents made their way to Jersey City too. Of course, of course, that so, was moving on up, right? Right, um, right. exactly. Yeah. Uh, have you found their information in the database? I haven't yet. I want to. Um, a cousin no. of mine, a cousin of mine, did some research quite a few years ago and found his um, grandparents there. Uh, so I'm going to, I want to do that. Yeah. And I've never been to the island. I've never been to the island. That's I another thing. If anyone on this going. call comes out, let me know. Let me know. And, you know, I'll put in a good word for you at our history center and stuff. Yeah. Don't hesitate. All right. Great. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Thank you again, Susan. It was really wonderful. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all back for our fourth Lunch and Learn in September. Have a great day. Everyone, summer. thanks so much. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. If I give you my email, can you send me Susan's contact information? Yes. So we have your email from when you signed up. So what oh, I'll do okay. is I'll send out a thank you afterwards with a recording of the presentation too, in case you missed oh, something. Perfect. And I'll include it in there. You've got it. And if you don't and get that from me this week, it'll probably come like Monday. I'm sure it's right. waited this long. <laughs> And it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good day. You too.